Well, hello and welcome to uh, our 20th edition of FCA Football's The Heart of the Coach. My name is Brian McKenzie. I have the privilege to serve as a director of football for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes in the Midwest region and beyond. And uh, the heart of the coach is we get a chance to interview some coaches and let them share their heart about the Lord and, and football. And uh, so today it's my privilege uh, to introduce our guest, uh, Philip Haywood. Uh, coach Haywood is uh, the head coach at Belfry High School. He's going into his 46th year of coaching high school football. He's the all-time wins leader in the state of Kentucky with 449 wins. And at least one or two of those wins was against the team I played on uh, back in the day when he first got to Belfry. And uh, he's won seven state championships, runner-up six times. And uh, Coach, welcome to the call. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm very honored to be on it today with you. Yeah, we're, we're honored to have you, Coach. And um, well, the first question I want to ask you, Coach, is uh, what first got you into football coaching? Well, uh, sports were always a passion of mine, you know, growing up. And uh, I played anything coming and going, though I think football was always my favorite. Now, I wasn't a great player or anything, just kind of average guy, but I, I loved sports. And, and I lived in an area where there were a bunch of kids, a bunch of boys, too. And uh, we had a big bottom that we played in, what we called it, and then it was always available. And when I was 13, I got a call from a guy, and I don't remember his name, and he said, how would you like to organize the boys in the neighborhood and for a Little League baseball team? And the head coach is out of town, and, and you just practice them and, and get, get them all out, get them started until he gets back. And I said, well, yeah, it sounds like I get to play more ball. You know, it was fun to me. And so I just did what I've been doing, just, just playing, you know. And uh, it turned out, uh, to make a long story short, the coach never showed up. And I ended up coaching Little League Baseball at 13 and did that all through high school. But I'd never coached football because I'd always played, you know, that particular sport. And I enjoyed uh, coaching baseball so much, I didn't play high school baseball. I just enjoyed working with the kids. But I had no idea I was going to go into coaching. Uh, my dad was an engineer, and uh, I worked with him a couple of summers. And I'm sitting there thinking about Little League baseball and the practices rather than plotting slopes. And I said, I don't think this is for me. And uh, when I got out of high school, I went to community college, and because of my I guess uh, reasonable success as a little league coach. Uh, they asked me to do a junior high football team. And boy, I did that a year and just fell in love with it and said, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. And wow. so I changed my major from uh, engineering to education. And, and that's how I got into it. And I've done it ever since. What year was that coach? Oh, that was back in the 60s uh, when I was coaching Little League. You couldn't do that today at 13, obviously. But uh, back then, I guess they were desperate for coaches. So anybody that could, would show up and work with kids would do that. I remember my mom, uh, she'd take us to practice and, and games. You know, I was the only coach that had a mother that had to drive the coach to practice, too. <laughs> oh, love that, Coach. Well, you know, I, I... I selfishly, I kind of wish you would have stuck with uh, baseball because I might have made the state championship my senior year if it wasn't for you all. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, coach, what you've been in a lot of football games, a lot of great football games. In fact, I, I got to play against you a couple of times and was coached by you in my senior year after in an all star game. But what was the greatest, one of the greatest football games you've been part of, and why was it so great? Yeah, I, I thought about that a little bit, and I've had that question asked me before. And and I'll give you the one I think that may have had the biggest impact on me personally, but we had a great one this year and it was in the semifinals. We were on the road against the sales and, and big underdogs because we, we our record wasn't that good going into the playoffs. And uh, we played to a nothing, nothing tie going into overtime and it went into two overtimes and uh, we had the ball last uh, scored and went for two and won 15 to 14 to put us into the championship game. And that that will be one of the all-time big wins in Belfry history. I can tell you that. But I, but I think the one that probably, as far as a big win, uh, not just for me, but for our community, was in 2003. And that was our first championship game. Uh, again, it was an overtime game. We're behind by a touchdown in the fourth quarter. And and get a turnover and punch it in to tie the game at 27. And then on fourth and one in overtime, we go in standing up uh, to win our first championship. 
Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you've pursued something a long time, I had the dubious honor of winning more games than anyone without winning a championship. So, so it, it was a long time coming before us getting that. And, and we'd come close. We'd had some really good teams, like you mentioned, and you all have had some good teams. And, and sometimes you just run against, up, up against people that are better than you or, or the ball just doesn't bounce your way. So uh, pursuing that and having that particular win was a great one for us. A very emotional, uh, a very spiritual uh, type of win. Yeah. yeah, I remember that, Coach. David Jones scored that, didn't he? He certainly did. He yeah. did. Yeah. I, I, you know, after you coached me, I began to follow the Belfry, too, and even root for Belfry. Don't tell anybody from Russell I did, but uh, <laughs> I followed. That was a great win. And since then, you've won six more state championships, so right. it's been a lot of fun. Well, Coach, why do you coach? What's your purpose in coaching? Uh, for whatever reason, uh, you know, I enjoyed the game, and, and I love the competition. Uh, the whole process. I, I just think it teaches you so much and it taught me so much. So I, maybe that's why I wanted to get into it other than that. But my biggest purpose in coaching has always been to make a difference in other people's lives through the process of coaching. If you listen to Nick Saban, he's always talking about the process and, and, and I don't talk exactly like he does, but I believe in a lot of the same things is, is, is get a little better each day. And that if we can be persistent, we can learn a lot. And that, and I think that's how our lives go. I think that's how our spiritual lives go. It just doesn't happen all at once. It takes a period of time and a deepening of whatever it is we're doing before we really appreciate something. I don't, I don't think you become passionate about something at 13. I think you may have an interest. I think you have an enjoyment. But I think it's over a period of time that your interest deepen into what you would call a passion. And, and the reason I coach is, is for that reason. I think there's a purpose, a higher calling in our lives than just going out and competing and winning games and giving kids a hug. It's when they call you back eight or 10 years later and, and, and thank you for what you've done or, or they may need something. And, and occasionally I'll get a letter for something like that or you're able to help somebody in some form or fashion and maybe you don't even know you're doing it. And, it's, and you have just an impact on kids' lives. So. I think everybody's got a calling. I think it's inside of you. And it's not always in coaching. It can be in other careers as well. But I think we have to kind of search for that. And, the, and you don't, it takes a while to find it, to find what you're doing. But that's my purpose. I, I'm, I'm very comfortable with what it is. And, and I just, uh, it gives me fulfillment in doing that. But if you're like you, you didn't have to search too long to find your, per, your, your calling. At 13 years old, you found it. Well, yeah, and I was very fortunate. Sometimes I think uh, God places things in your life uh, to, to, it just falls into place for you. And some of the people that have fallen into place for me have been very instrumental in, in what I've been able to do. And I look back and I said, yeah, this couldn't just be coincidence. You know, it's got to be a little bigger than that. There's something bigger going on than, than me just always taking the right steps. Not to say I've made a lot of mistakes, but there's just been too many great people come into my life at just the right time to say this is the direction you need to go and or don't do this and you know those kind of things so I think God always has a hand in our lives and it's just up to us to learn to listen to how he's guiding us yeah exactly right well coach how do you want your relationship with Jesus to practically impact your players at Belfry on a on a daily basis you know, you just try to do the right thing. And I, I, don't, I don't try to put on a big airs. And I tell our kids frequently, you know, we still have devotions on uh, game day mornings. It's before school, so it makes it legal. And, and I'll lead some, and sometimes our coaches do, and we'll bring in some guests. Uh, mm -hmm. So we try to have a spiritual element to our program. But, uh, you know, I, I'll be the first to tell our kids, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. And I said, you all know I make mistakes. <laughs> you know, you, you've got to understand those things. But I think if your heart's in the right place and you're doing the right thing and you can tell kids that you really care about them and you can show it that way, then it makes a difference in, in how they perceive you. And I think it's so important for our young people to have good role models and I don't necessarily hold myself up as the best role model in the world, but I, but I try to do good. And, and I think that it's seen some imperfection as well as a person that tries to do the right thing. And I've got a staff of guys that do the same thing. 
gives these kids a chance to say, hmm, maybe, maybe I can live my life like that too. And I think that's been true because I have so many that come back and talk about uh, what they've done in their, in their spiritual lives after they got out of high school. That'll be one of the first things they tell me is, hey, did you know, you know, I got involved in this church or I, I, I gave my life to Christ because they know it's kind of important to me even though they might not have ever mentioned it in high school, but that's something that they want to share with me. Yeah, that's great. Great coach. Well, coach, uh, in, in 46 years of coaching, you've been around a lot of good coaches and probably been influenced by a lot of good coaches. Can you name a couple of those most influential coaches in your life and why they were so influential? Yes. I could probably name more than two. <laughs> I bet. But, yeah. But, but, yeah, the first was Roy Walton at uh, Tate's Creek High School in Lexington. And uh, th this is an interesting story. My high school football coach as a junior left and, and his assistant took his place. In those days, you know, you just had two coaches. You had a head and an assistant if you were lucky. And the guy he got as his assistant was a former player at Moorhead State. And he ran a business in town. He actually used to coach, but he said, I couldn't make a living coaching, so I had to start a business. And, and he was very successful. But he had a passion for the game that, that really kind of got to me. And so when I decided to go into coaching, I went and talked with him about it. And I said, here's what I want to do. He said, well, when you get ready to do your student teaching, call me. I played with a guy at uh, Roy Walton at Moorhead. And I said, I'll give him a call and he'll hook you up to do student teaching there. And you can start coaching with him at the beginning of the year. And that was, that was another one of those kind of divine intervention things, uh, you know, to have a guy that knew a guy who became probably the greatest mentor of my life for 38 years until he passed away. Mm -hmm. And the biggest influence that he had was never about X's and O's. It was all about character and doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And if I've made mistakes, especially early in my career, it was because I thought I had to answer the problem or solve the problem myself and I said man if I just picked up the phone and called coach Walton and not been you know, like young coaches do think I got to do it all you know I got to solve the problem uh, I'm the head coach so it's on me and just realized hey there's a lot of people out there to help you and as I got older you know I not only enlisted him <laughs> but other people so I, I've got a whole bunch of people call say hey I got an issue here you know I need a little help with this well, you know, give me your thoughts on it. I know I'll have to make the decision. But, yeah, he was that kind of an influential guy. He helped me with business relationships, with just character and the way you do things. And I'll, I'll always remember that. Mm -hmm. well, that's great. I, I, I know Coach Walton. He, he's, he's a legend there in, in Lexington and all through Kentucky. For, for, like you said, most of he won a lot of games, but he also was just a classy man. Yeah. He, he was, absolutely. Well, Coach, as a head football coach, you, you can be very busy, especially during the fall. That's just part of the game. Therefore, many head coaches uh, disappear from their local church, all right, in the fall. That just it happens. It gets so busy, and, and that becomes a secondary thing. Why is it so important for you to be a committed member of your local church, and, and how are you involved in your local church? Well, I just have always – I wouldn't say always. I, I went through a little period in college and early in my career where I didn't maybe think it was that important to be there on Sunday morning. Uh, but at some point, I got married and I got uh, became a head coach, and I realized that uh, there was it, it was the right thing to do. And even if my life wasn't quite right, I knew it was the right thing to do. So uh, through those things, that's kind of what got me in the right frame of getting close to Jesus again. But yeah, we, uh, and most of my coaches are this way too. Like on Sundays, we'll have a meeting right after church, but we don't start till 1230 or whenever your church ends. You just roll in and then we'll bring a snack or a salad or a lunch. And then we just go to work until we get done, but we don't start till then. And I'll get up early Sunday mornings. I, you know, I might get up at five or six o'clock to do whatever I didn't finish on Saturday, but I make time to spend time with Linda on Saturday evenings and and uh, I think it's just uh, how you prioritize things. And uh, we, we've been able to do it. We've been able to do it a long time. And I think for me personally, as the head coach, by setting that example, our younger coaches are seeing that, yes, you can do this. You can still keep God 
uh, first in your life and still keep a presence with him and do that. So what do I do at church? Uh, I, I work with youth on Wednesday nights and I'm a part-time uh, uh, choir director. Uh, I, I kind of fell into that. My mom was a music teacher and, and the choir person retired and they said, well, won't you do this? Your mom knew music. And I said, well, that doesn't mean I do. <laughs> you know. So I, um, I, I do that as well. And we're a real small church. So if you can do something, they get you to do a little bit of everything, you know. But uh, I, I've, I've been able to stay busy, but working with youth has been a real blessing because it kind of is a totally different atmosphere from practice and just being able to come in and sit down and uh, talk about spiritual things and get away from the stress of practice and getting ready for games and those kind of things. Yeah. Well, Coach, what, what are some of the foundational principles that have helped you build a championship culture there at Belfry? Well, they're really very simple. I, I gave a message to our parents my first year here, and I give them the same one every year. It hasn't changed. So I'm not going to give you the whole talk. That might take a few minutes. But, you know, our programs have been based on attitude. It's based on doing things the right way. And if I was to sum up my life and if I was to sum up what we try to do, it's, it's work hard, do the right thing, and eventually good things are going to happen for you. And that, that's a real quick summary of what we do. I can go into a little more detail if you'd like it, but, but that, that, that's our philosophy. And uh, I, I borrowed a little bit from Lou Holtz, which is part of that, uh, about doing the right thing, treat others as you would like to be treated, which is the golden rule, and um, to show your teammates you care. And then all those are attitudinal traits. They're character traits. But I think if that's your foundation, the rest of the stuff will take care of itself. Yeah. And Coach, how, how, how many years did, did your teams work hard and do the right thing before you won a state championship? Oh, I lost count. Uh, we, <laughs> I, I don't know. I've been coaching it. I was at Prestonsburg for nine years, and then I was at Belfry from 84 to 2003. So I was like 29 years. Yeah. That, that we'd done the right thing, we'd worked hard, and we'd come close, but we just hadn't won the championship. And, you know, I, I've always believed this, too, and, and someone said it better than I'm going to say it right now, that if, if you work hard and do the right thing, there's really no guarantee of success. Hmm. We, we know that. That's just a part of it. Right. But there's a guarantee that you can be fulfilled. Hmm. And I think that's the key to life. Are you content? Are you doing the best that you can do? And and will it fall back into you and into your heart? And, and you can go home at night and say, you know, I did the best I could with the abilities that I have. Mm. That's so good. So good to hear, Coach. You're right, because some of us will never win a state championship or a ch conference championship, but you can still be fulfilled. That's good. Absolutely. Well, Coach, you, you mentioned again here you're going into your 46th year of coaching high school football. So – what is something you wish you would have known? You've already mentioned one thing, but something else you may wish you would know when you were a young coach that you know now that you'd maybe like to pass off to some young coaches that are in a business now. I would, I would say enjoy the, enjoy the journey. I think sometimes we get so caught up in the day-to-day -day activities that we, we just don't enjoy the little things that take place every day. And, and I know there's a lot of coaches on the line today and, and, and we, we enjoy our, our coaching staff. We have a, a ball in any group I've been around. So I don't think it's just, just for us. I think everyone does. I think you need to enjoy those moments and, and realize how special they really are, the relationships that you develop. And, and I'll, I'll go back to what I'd said earlier. I, I think sometimes that we think we're in our own little bubble and there's people out there that can help you and, and be willing to make that call. And the older I get, the more calls I make. I can tell you that. I, I, when I was young, I, I just felt like, oh, I'm, I'm the person in charge. I have to know what to do. And I just think that's one of the biggest mistakes young people make. And I was still making that mistake, mistake in my 30s. You know? And sometimes you know, you got to make sure that people don't influence you in the wrong way. It's got to be you making the decision. But I think you need to get all the facts. And is there another way to do it? I've got a great mentor, uh, Paul Dotson. He was the athletic director and um, uh, assistant principal at Belfry for many years and, and retired. He was actually assistant superintendent uh, for eight years before he retired. So, so he, he has a lot of experience, and I still talk with him. 
I still call him and, and I'll, I'll ask a question and say, what, what, how, how do you think of what think about this? Here's what I'm thinking. And he'll say, have you ever thought about this or just giving me a different perspective? And it doesn't mean I'll do it, but he gives me that different perspective, something to uh, bounce, bounce my ideas off of. And I think we all need that because we just get caught up in our own little bubble sometimes. And you just need those people around you that you can trust and confide in. Yeah, that's great. Coach. And I think of all coaching fraternities uh, of coaches that are willing to share advice. I, I've never met a coaching fraternity like the fo football fraternity. Absolutely. So many coaches are willing to, to pass on and, and teach you things they've learned. Absolutely. I, I, I get some calls, you know, from some young coaches. I was actually supposed to meet with a couple this spring. And then of course, the uh, coronavirus struck, so we haven't been able to meet. But I, I, whether it's me or, or Coach Walton or the person in your life, uh, you'd be amazed at the people that are willing to share information with you, especially about the how-tos, you know, how to, how to do it, where you are in your life. You know, what, should I go to college? Should I stay in high school? Should I uh, move to a different city? Uh, you know, and ask you the questions that sometimes we need to hear to make those decisions because they may have had the same situation with them or uh, just be able to give you some advice from a different perspective. Yeah. Well, coach, what's one of the biggest challenges you face as a coach in your coaching career and how did your relationship with Christ help you walk through that challenge? The, the biggest challenge, single challenge I faced um, took place in 1976. And I was a second year head coach. I was 25 and, and, you know, I had all this energy and didn't have a clue of what I was doing. But one of our players in a championship district championship game, it was going to be our first district win, uh, was injured and paralyzed during that game. Mm. And you, you know, you hear about this kind of thing and, and social media now, you know, if it happens, it's all over the place and you hear about it, you know, whether it's pros or college or high school team. But in those days, it just wasn't as, as rare or as, as, as common. And, and the thing is, is I never thought about that happening to me. That was one of those that I wasn't prepared for. So you, you, you know about the impact it's going to have on the player and their family. And, and, and the, but you don't realize the impact it has on your team, on your community, your school, and on you. And that was the most difficult time in my life in coaching because I questioned whether I, I, I needed to keep doing this. I said, I didn't know if I could go out there again and take a chance on, on, a, on another injury like this. You start asking yourself questions that you never thought about. And, and I knew I loved the game. I knew I was going to do it the rest of my life. But somewhere in the back of my mind was that doubt about the, the fear. And I talked with, uh, many of our players since then. And I had a great relationship with Stuart, by the way. Um, you know, during his rehab, you know, he had great, uh, uh, he, he overcame adversity and he really fought through all this stuff. And I'll never forget the night he wheeled back into our locker room. You know, it was about three years later. But he had a big smile on his face and he really enjoyed that. And we've always talked throughout the years. Uh, he was one of the first one or two people that called me after we won our first state championship. He, we talked off and on before then. But, you know, he called a couple of years ago, and uh, he said, Coach, I, I just want you to know I've had a great life, and I've outlived my life expectancy by four years. I'm a tough guy. <laughs> he said, but, but I, I, I've, lived, I've lived a good life. I don't have any regrets. I still love football. I just wish the accident had happened at the end of my career, not when I was a sophomore. Mm -hmm. And then he paused a little bit, and uh, – Give me a second. And, and he said, his voice changed a little. He said, Coach, do you, do you think I would have been a good player? Mm -hmm. Oh, but then, you know, tears are coming down my cheeks. And I said, yes, Stuart, you're going to be a great player. And he died four weeks later. Mm -hmm. But this young man overcame his adversity and he grew and influenced the entire community. He grew from tragedy to success and from success to significance. And he taught us all how you handle that kind of stuff. 
And so even though in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't know if I could do this again. All I had to do was visit him, which I did regularly, and see what, how he was fighting this, to know that, hey, if he can do this, I know I can. And I knew our players could too, because I had to meet with them. They had that same fear. Uh, I still remember that first practice we had after that. It was like a tomb out there. You, you, it was, it was just dead. You couldn't, you couldn't. There was no life or anything. But once we got going, once we started tackling a little bit and banging around with our shoulder pads, it picked up, and and we had a little life about us. And we finished the season. Actually, won a big game or two, you know, along the way on the, on the as we finished out the year. But I talked with one of those players and uh, just recently, sometime in the last year or two, he said, Coach, I, I got your book. I said, well, thanks. It's been out about four years. I'm glad you finally picked up a copy. And he said, well, I opened it up and you started the book with this story about Stewart. And he said, I, I, I had to put it down. It, it brought it back so vividly of what we went through together as a team that I just wasn't able to read it. He said, eventually I will. He said, but I, I've got to get mentally prepared for this. Mm-hmm. So, so for, for me and, and everything that's probably happened to me in my life, and you know, I've lost my parents and all these different things. That was the most significant thing that taught me more about how to live and how you have to lean on Christ to get you through the tough times in life. Mm-hmm. Well, Coach, thanks for sharing that story. Uh, guys, as you can see, uh, Coach Hayward has a lot of wisdom to pass on, and I'm thankful he spent this time with us. But I'll open it up if one, some of you guys might have a, a question for Coach Hayward. I got a question for Coach. Yeah, the, hi, this is Gene Kruma, Judson University coach. I, I, have, I have a question. What do you do to get – your assistant coaches motivated in that that same way at times when they're not feeling that cultural shift that you're trying to encourage them to be a part of? Well, I, I, I think that, that it's a process that I, I, I've never came in and, and just said, well, I'm going to change the culture today. You know, I've always looked down the road and I said, I've got to get people to buy into me first of what I believe in, what we want to do. And I've always put the program above me, obviously, and say, here's what we need to do. So when I I first came to Belfry, of course, I inherited some assistant coaches, which was really exciting for me because uh, I I only had one hired coach at the school I was at previously. And so I had three hired here. Now we've upped it to about five and uh, we have quite a few volunteers. But, but I started with them the same way I do with anyone is that, you know, here's my philosophy. We've got to work hard. We, we've got to do the right thing. And, uh, you know, good things are going to happen to us. And I certainly involve them. You know, I, I've always given them a lot of responsibility. I want them to take ownership of what we're doing. And I, I sit down and I met with each one of those guys individually. I wanted to listen to them. I wanted to hear where they were in their careers and what they thought about the program. And then I started laying out what I saw in the future. Here's where, here's where I want us to be somewhere down the road. And, and here's what we're going to start with. And as I start talking about respect and loyalty and accountability and caring for each other. And, and it's not anything about the coaching on the field, but it's about those little things. And I just think that you just got to keep um, talking with, with your coaches about those things and encouraging them and, and demonstrating to them this, this is the way it's going to be. If we'll do this, it'll work. And it's a process. And I, I've, I've had some coaches come to me and over the years and said, you made a difference in my life. But just because of the way you went about things, it wasn't any one thing, but it was all those little things together. And that's one of the things that I say frequently, you just got to do the little things right and get a little better each day. So, so I, I think the most important thing is not your players. I think it's your coaches. I think you got to get guys on board and, and be willing to bend a little, give a little in certain areas, certain areas you don't give at all because you know what's the most important thing, but you got to be a teacher and, and you know what you want, teach them what you want get them to buy in and it's a lot easier now because everybody's pretty much on board and now 
uh, a new, new person comes in, they just kind of say, well, this is the way it's done here now. So uh, it, it's a process. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of the way I've gone about it over the years. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Great, great question to end on too. Well, guys, we've come to the end of our time again. Before you go, I want to, I want to share, my, share my screen with you and show you something here. Um, you bear with me just a second. So I hope you can see this. Here's Coach Hayward. This is his book, Faith, Family, and Football. He didn't ask me to do this, didn't mention it, but I know it's out there. Uh, it's on Amazon, Faith, Family, Football by Philip Hayward. Uh, I want to encourage you guys, hey, leaders are readers, and this would be a great book for you to spend your time reading um by coach hayward so again he didn't ask me to do that but I, I thought you guys would be interested in knowing that's out there on amazon i encourage you to get a copy uh well before i say goodbye to coach uh, i, I want to let you know this wednesday this is all-time week right so we just had the all-time winningest coach in kentucky this wednesday we're going to have the all-time winningest coach uh in illinois history ken leonard in fact a few years ago i got a chance to introduce coach hayward to coach leonard so we had it, both of them together it's pretty neat he'll be wednesday and then friday the all-time wins leader at Wheaton College, Mike Swider, who just retired, will be with us on the Heart of the Coach. And I hope you guys can join us for that. Well, Coach Hayward, thanks for, so much for being with us and uh, sharing your heart with us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All right. God bless you, Coach. God bless all you all. You'll have a great day. Well, Coach, thanks again for your time, brother. Okay, thanks a lot. I enjoyed it. All right. I hope it went well. It went well. It sure did. All thanks right. so much. Thanks. Bye now.